Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Utah Stories Show. My name is Rich Marcosian. I'm the editor and publisher of Utah Stories Magazine. On the program today, a very exciting guest. It's David Broderick, who is a professional trainer of dogs. And if you know our Instagram channel and you know Utah Stories, we absolutely love dogs. And so it was really exciting to have you on the show. Thanks for coming on, David. Oh, it's my pleasure. Pleasure to be here. Great. So the first question I have for you is a lot of people have dogs that are constantly trying to get off leash. They're lots and lots of energy. And me and my dogs and I, we run all the time. So my dogs don't have that problem. What's your number one piece of advice to somebody who has a dog that is just too energetic, constantly going after people, jumping up on people? Um, I think that's the, probably the number one biggest problem I see with other people's dogs. What, what would you advise for them to get their dog to calm down a little bit? Yeah, so I would say that that's the, probably the biggest issue I see in pet dogs uh, is just an abundance of energy. Um, I don't know if you know what a Belgian Malinois is, but my newsfeed on Facebook, Instagram has been blowing up by the dog that took down, uh, the ISIS leader. So that dog was a Belgian Malinois and that's what I own personally. And that's what I compete with there. In my opinion, the most energetic dogs, we call them German shepherds on crack. So they're, <laughs> they've got a lot of energy. Um, and to, to get some of that energy out, the biggest thing for me is mental exercise. So a lot of people think if I just go throw a ball for a half hour, my dog will be, you know, worn out, it'll calm down. That's not necessarily true. If I go throw a ball for my dogs, they, you know, they'll, they'll tell me they need another half hour. And then I throw for another half hour, they want another hour. So all I'm doing with them is just building their stamina and they never really get tired. So for me, it's mental exercise. There's a number of things that we can do for that. Uh, but anything to get their mind going, a very good one that I, that a lot of people are getting into now is nose work, uh, makes the dog use their nose, but also their brain. Um, and then just really anything else. So we do structured walks where the dogs walk right next to us. The dog thinking about staying right next to me is very difficult for them. They're, they're thinking of their position. They're thinking of, uh, paying attention to me when I stop. Uh, I ask them to sit when, when I stop and they, I teach them to do it automatically. So a lot of things are going through their mind the entire time. Uh, but really anything like that, teaching something new, you know, in the winter we do we put out a lot of videos of different things that we can train during the winter because nobody wants to go out and walk their dog, you know, mm -hmm. if it's freezing cold outside. So, so we do a lot of videos for, for that kind of stuff, hiding their food, uh, teaching them to go to a placemat, to, uh, touch something like a, a paper plate. We, there are games called paper plate games. There's a lot of things that you can do, but really just anything to make them use their brain. So do you find that it, it's just not exercise just doesn't cut it to get dogs to calm down? It's, it's really is just all mental then for the most part. Yeah. So there are some dogs that a little bit of physical exercise does help them, but for a lot of dogs, physical exercise doesn't really do anything to get them to calm down. Hmm. It just really, you know, uh, over the last five, six months, I've been preparing for a, a competition, uh, over in Poland. And so, you know, for the, the first couple of times I went and ran, uh, 15 minute run killed me. Now I run for an hour and I'm still like, I, I need more exercise. And it's the same with dogs. If we work, if we run them and play fetch with them or, you know, anything like that pretty soon, they just say, I need more, I need more, I need more. And so we're building stamina. I, I say the same thing when, when dogs go to daycares and, and dog parks, you know, a lot of people think, Oh, I'll take my dog to a daycare. It'll wear it out. It'll come home. And then pretty soon they take it to daycare five days a week. And on the weekend, it drives them absolutely nuts because it's not getting those outlets. Mm -hmm. So it's, they're building up stamina, running all day long, playing with other dogs. And then on the weekend, their dog's driving them crazy because they're not getting those outlets. So more sense. so than anything is mental exercise. My dogs in 20, 30 minutes of, of a little bit of mental exercise and they're whooped. So that's what I recommend to all of my clients is just the mental exercise. Huh. That's, that's a real eye opener for me. Cause I take my dogs, we now go about six miles a day. I have mm -hmm. an Irish setter and a golden retriever, but the Irish setter, man, it, if it's like eight 30 in the morning and we haven't gone on a run, he just starts beating me with his paws and he just climbs up on me and He's just like, we got to go. I know if we don't go now, you'll never take me. Yeah. He just like a really smart dog and really persuasive. Yeah. 
And uh, but I notice like if we go on a three mile run, he's not happy. If we go on a four or five, it's got to be six now. And uh, so it's gotten me into good shape. But no. I I also find like walking them around the block, they're just frustrated now. They're just like this sucks. We don't want to do this. We want to. And I let them off leash in the parks because they'll stay with me. Yeah. But do you can you walk your dog? I mean, you said having your dog walk next to you. Yep. How do you how do you practice that? How do you teach that to your dog? So really, so I, I don't know uh, I don't know how much you know about me, but I run a couple different businesses. One is a, a pet dog training business called Innovative Canine Academy. So I've been uh, running that business for about eight years now. Um, I've been training dogs for twenty two years, I believe, uh, is when I started. Oh. Uh, but the biggest thing. I got into German Shepherds at a young age. I, I got my first German Shepherd when I was 10. And German Shepherds, there are a couple other breeds that really enjoy pulling. And so for dogs that, that enjoy pulling, I don't like to take them for walks because they very quickly learn to pull on the leash, which isn't necessarily a bad thing for all dogs, but it is definitely bad for some of these breeds that as soon as they start pulling and we start, start saying, all right, you're pulling a little bit too much. I'm no longer going to allow you to pull towards that dog or pull towards that person. And then when we restrain them, when we say, you know, you're 80 pounds now, you don't get to go say hi anymore because you're pulling me over. They get frustrated and that frustration turns into what we call leash reactivity or leash aggression. So leash reactivity is probably the most common aggression or common issue that I get in pet dogs that I train. And all of that is created by dogs pulling. So we teach the dogs to walk nicely next to us. And when I'm raising, for example, a German Shepherd from a very, very young age, eight, you know, eight weeks old, if possible, I'm already teaching them just with food that right next to me is what we call a reward zone. So that's where they're going to get all of their rewards. It's not out in front of me, three feet pulling me on my leash. It's right next to me. And then as they get a little bit older, we can use the leash to also communicate back up sit, lay down and teach them where we want them as well. But in the beginning, it's just with food. I just never allow those dogs to pull me around ever. Mm -hmm. um, pit bulls are the same. A lot of people think pit bulls are just these overly aggressive dogs. They're not necessarily aggressive. They just frustrate very easily. That's what mm -hmm. they're bred. That's what they're bred for. The same as German shepherds. We've been breeding shepherds for 120 years to bark very well. The, the, the breed test in Germany called Schutzen was, um, is basically a, a test to see if the dog is worthy to breed. And so to do that, they have to bark very well. They have to uh, frustrate easily to bite something because it's a protection sport. And so all of those things have been bred into some of these breeds for a decade, a century, huh. whatever. To and frustrate easily. That's actually a very trait easily. they, Absolutely. they wanted back when they were breeding dogs. For it, even nowadays. So if you go to Germany, you can't breed two German Shepherds without a breed survey, which is a, a competition that they have to go and pass off. So you can't just take two German Shepherds and say, I'm going to breed these dogs and have a litter of puppies without that without that breed test and that wow. survey. So, hmm. and that survey is, is technically a protection sport. We call Schutzen. It's changed over and the years. And if they a don't, bunch of like, if they don't have like a short fuse, then you can't breed them? Not necessarily. It just makes it easier. So those dogs that bark very easily, they bark at the bad guy a lot mm -hmm. easier. And so they're uh, easier to train and easier to get those titles. And, and sometimes, for example, IPO, the Sch Schutzen sport is... Uh, specifically pointed on how the dog barks. So if the dog doesn't bark well, you lose points. If it doesn't bark rhythmically, if it doesn't bark like it's defensive, like it, it's barking at a bad guy, a number of these things are looked at and judged. And so we've been selecting for dogs that bark very easily. They bark rhythmically. They bark in a deep... Uh, I guess deep that makes bark. sense because if if you have a dog for protection, I think a lot of people in you know bad neighborhoods do uh, then that makes a lot of sense that yep. you yeah yeah so i found when i when one of my my both of my dogs died my old dogs and we live in a, on an alleyway and we had all of our crap stolen within three months of my dog dying because yeah he would i think they're able to sense um people's intention do you get do you get that idea because they're they really bark hardcore at some people and then other people, they don't bark at all. Yeah. So I, I think that's more so they're, they're picking up uh, small, subtle, subtle 
uh, sense of like adrenaline. So uh, if I'm going to rob somebody, I'm more than likely going to have adrenaline pumping through my body and dogs can definitely smell detect that. that. Right. Really? So, uh-huh. Uh, I, I, I hear it a lot. I do a lot of dog competitions where I go out and I compete with my dogs in, in big competitions in different countries. And I know 100% my dog picks up differently when I'm in a big competition versus when I'm just out training and more so because of my adrenaline levels and everything. So All picks up from, picks I up from you, yep. your cues more in a bigger competition. Yep. So I huh. definitely think they pick up those. So if somebody's coming to rob my house, they're going to be acting different than somebody that is just coming to bring me a package so i think dogs do pick up on that on that stuff absolutely so do you do you think that the way we breed dogs in the united states compared to germany is inferior because we don't have that criteria that the dog has to meet yeah absolutely i mean uh obviously we have a big website here in utah ksl.com um they sell uh, everybody puts dogs on there, right? Mm-hmm. Those dogs, when you're not looking at temperament, when you're not looking at different traits that the dogs were specifically bred for, or if you're not specifically uh, breeding towards some goal, yeah, you're going to lose desirable traits. Mm-hmm. So if I'm looking at color, I'm no longer looking at the health of the dog. I'm no longer looking at the temperament of the dog. I'm, lo- I'm trying to select specifically for a color. So I see that uh, very common in like Huskies, people are wanting two blue eyes and German shepherds, they want long white hair or, or the black coat or whatever, you know, when they're specifically selecting for those, they're getting away from what the dogs were designed to do in the first place. Yeah. And then you have issues. Well, you're, I, what I'm finding is like the doodle craze is just yep. blowing up. Yep. I'm seeing like on the trails about every fourth dog is a doodle. Do you think that's a good trend? Do you, do you believe like the because of the um, uh, the poodles are so smart and the um, other dog they breed them with is has, is so energetic that that that's something that's positive. So I, I, so kind of just depends on what you're aiming for. So in my opinion, doodles are uh, kind of going towards the the pet homes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the people that want just a nice easy going dog with that doesn't shed all over their house all of those all of those things and Mm. that's exactly what they they are you know Mm. um i i I would say we probably train 25 percent of the dogs that we train are doodles right now we are swamped with doodles all the time um i think they're a fantastic dog i think they they have the traits that people need in yeah they just seem super friendly those kind of things um the thing is you're you're not seeing a lot of breeders out there that are doing it in my opinion correctly they're not checking for health tests they're not uh you know going through checking their hips and elbows and eyes and and all of those things so you're gonna have dogs that are those dogs are gonna over time kind of get the same way every other dog goes if they're not health tested they're gonna start to get away from why they were breeding the dog in the first place and start paying attention to only color or size Mm -hmm. and those things but right now I would say most of the dogs that I train that are doodles are fantastic. Yeah. I personally, I like them a lot for pet It's homes. It's like they, it's, it's kind of like I look at it like the, the most popular dog for a long, long time, it seemed like were Labradors and Golden Retrievers. Yep. Like you would just see those everywhere. And I've had two Goldens and you can totally see why. They're just like the sweetest dogs. Yep. And our our old golden that passed away, she just loved everybody. Yep. She was so excited to see absolute strangers, like in homeless people. She loved to go up to them and just brighten up their day. Yep. And um, w- but on the other hand, golden retrievers have been, I heard, overbred, and so that they they're way prone to hip dysplasia. They're way prone to genetic abnormalities. And what, what is it that breeders aren't doing that is causing that to happen? So a, a, a number of the things that I mentioned before, selecting for color, selecting for, um, you, you know. You need like diversity in the gene pool, right? Is it just too, too, too much of the same genes being no, redistributed? So, so actually, typically, uh, when, you're, when you're breeding, doing what we call inbreeding is actually good for the 
genetic health of the dog. So oh, really? when, you, when you start inbreeding and line breeding on dogs, you're actually taking traits that you know are good and you're selecting for those traits and you're trying to bring those traits out more. So the, if you look at the top breeders that are breeding uh, any dog to do something specific, they typically want, do mostly line breeding uh, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what you're talking about is what we call an outcross. So if you take two dogs that are not related at all and you breed those together, the genetics can be extremely widely, uh, variable. So for example, if I take, uh, a lab and a poodle, this is a great outcross. Mm -hmm. You're very unlikely to ha have health issues in those because those two genes don't match up at all because they're different mm -hmm. breeds of dogs. But you also can't say, I'm pretty sure that this dog is going to have this, this, and this, right? Yeah. These traits, because you can't say that because the genetics are all over the place. Whereas mm -hmm. if you take two dogs that are uh, maybe from the same grandfather and this dog had uh, great hips, it had a full bite, which is something we care about in protection sports. If you have these things, it's more than likely going to produce that in the puppies if you're line breeding on that dog. Makes sense. So when, when you're looking at, for example, labs and golden retrievers, and you're saying that they're, they're now showing a lot of hip dysplasia, that's because a lot of people are breeding dogs and no longer testing their dogs. So a hunt test in itself is a test. If they can go out there and they can uh, swim and they can jump and they can run and do all of these things, that's a, that's a test in itself. They're not, you know, it's obviously not going to show you exactly how the hips look or how the elbows look or anything like that, but it's showing that the dog can work. It's showing that it has a good temperament. It's showing that it's not afraid of gunfire. There's a, a number of things in that, uh, in that sport or whatever you want to yeah. call it that is a test. And so... In all of the protection sports, they have obedience, so the dog has to show that it can be obedient. They have, uh, to a degree, agility, so the dogs have to do jumps, and then they have bite work. And if the dog can do all of these jumps and all of those things, a lot like back 20 years ago, you couldn't just go and x-ray your dog's hips and say, yeah, they look perfect. Mm -hmm. So they relied on those things to tell you if the dog was good enough to be bred. Mm -hmm. And now we have x-rays, we have all of these things, DM tests and all of these DNA, DNA tests that we can do. Uh, but a lot of people in America, when they're breeding, they're not looking at any of that stuff. They're just looking at, ah, oh, I could make $5,000 on this litter. Yeah. With doodles, I could make $25,000. You know, if you have... 10 puppies in yeah, a litter and you sell them for $2,500, it, it adds up quickly. So they're thinking more about the money versus the bettering the breed. So, yeah. Yeah. That's you know. definitely what we found with our second golden retriever. She was on KSL in West Valley and she was brought back to the breeder. Somebody had her and brought her back. She was extremely timid. Yep. Like she wouldn't look at us. She was burying her face in this little girl's a lap and she didn't want to go and it's like we but we we saw that we were like man and what's what's going on and and she said oh well she's the run of the litter and we'll give her we'll give her to you half off yeah. and and it was like we were like really reluctant because she was so timid and yeah. but slowly over time she's become this amazing dog but it's taken her like two three years to get over her her timidity and her, her just shyness and uh and I think her just being the run, I, I don't think she might've been traumatized probably with her previous owner and something like that. Something bad happened. Yeah. But. So, so that, that's, that's another thing. I, I, I hear that actually a lot when, uh, when I have clients come and bring their dogs and they're talking about their dogs is I hear that a lot that the dogs were maybe abused or, you know, traumatized. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, that's very unlikely. If you, if you look at people today, people are so careful about how they treat dogs. And so, yeah, it's hard to thoughtful. imagine somebody abusing or right. traumatizing, especially a, a puppy. Right. Yeah. Um, and so in my opinion, it's extremely unlikely that that happens and more, more much more likely that the dog was just bred incorrectly and they weren't paying mm -hmm. attention to temperament. And so, yeah, you're going to have dogs that are nervous in the litter. You're going to have dogs that are fearful. And again, when you're breeding dogs that aren't related, you know, you don't know what the genetics are going to turn out like. So they could have been great parents, but the genetics were so wide that you're going to get a, a nervous puppy in the litter or whatever. So maybe it was a runt. Maybe it was just a nervous puppy. I don't know. But mm -hmm. I do know that it's more likely that the dog was that way genetically versus 
cause to be like that from the previous owner. So, yeah. so with dogs like that, we just do a lot of confidence building. We do a ton of positive reinforcement food training and build their confidence to the point that they just say, oh, I don't care about this new person. I don't care about that dog. I don't care about this new environment. That's, mm-hmm. that's the biggest thing. That's cool. So. Yeah. I, fi- I find when I tell that story about our dog, there's a lot of people with dogs that are really shy. Yep. It's not uncommon. And, yep. and you, and then those people don't take their dogs to dog parks because they just know they're not going to have fun. Yep. And our, we don't take her to a dog park because she just doesn't like it. <laughs> yeah. And, and dogs are like humans to a degree, mm-hmm. right? Dogs have personalities just like we do. I don't necessarily like to go out and go to a club and party. I like to stay at home and hang out with my dogs my yeah, kids that kind too. of thing so dogs are are the same in that way not every dog wants to go to a daycare not every dog wants to go to a dog park not every dog wants to do those things mm-hmm. you know that they're just not that way socially and us trying to make them become that way will actually make it worse mm-hmm. so there are just some dogs that don't enjoy those things and i you know i personally i don't take my dogs to dog parks anyway i i just don't think they're a safe place to go but if my dogs enjoyed it if, or if they didn't, I'm going to, I'm going to look at my dog and say, my dog hates this. Why am I going to continue putting him in this situation? Yeah. It's funny. These, these two dogs we got, they both just do not like dog parks. They just like the mountains. They like hikes. They like being off leash. They, They make it totally clear to me what they like. And, uh, and, and dog parks are not for them, but my previous two dogs, they, they love dog parks. They love meeting new dogs and But what I find really fascinating with my dogs is when I'm up in the mountains and we're on a trail, we're hiking, they will catch a scent together. And then they are working together as a team to like decide what to do. And it's almost like they got this unspoken plan where one's on the top part barking whatever it is They're, they've been into turkeys lately they've gotten found three turkeys in the mountains mm. just recently and one's barking it trying to flush it the other one's down the mountain a little bit hoping it's going to like catch them do, do you find that dogs have this sort of natural instinct to work in teams as like a as a pack together yeah so i actually i actually get a lot of people that that say it's it's not how you raise them or it, it's more so how you raise them versus their genetics to me that's 100 percent incorrect if you look at a, a litter of pointers and you go in and you take a wing on a string and you make that wing move it watch their genetics you can't teach a 8 10 12 week old pointer to you can't teach a whole litter to do the exact same thing when that happens it's 100 percent genetic what what they do the mm-hmm. same with labs the same with border collies that are that are hurting all of these things are genetically in them and so it's just amazing so so yeah they absolutely do and they and they also learn uh relatively quickly how to do those things so i'm sure the first time they they did something and they probably tried it and said oh that worked a little bit and then the next time they improved and each time they'll improve on how they how they work as a pack together mm-hmm. so absolutely dogs are fascinating that way yeah they they're just in tune to each other very much yep. and and they all and so my dog joey um who's an irish setter i guess that is that's kind of like a, a pointer in that he's all about flushing things right, right. And he just loves to just go through the forest and flush whatever he can out. And and uh, I don't know what the setting is. What is what does that mean if your dog is a setter? I don't or... I don't I don't know what that comes from actually. Yeah. Um, but there are dogs that are going to be flushers. There are dogs that, that are going to be retrievers. And so typically you would you, you know you would use one dog to flush it. You you get your bird, and then you have another dog that would go and retrieve it for you, mm-hmm. um, unless. And there are going to be places that you can retrieve it easily, so you only need a, a dog to flush. And there are going to be places that you don't need a dog to flush. You only need a dog that retrieves if you're out in the pond or whatever. And so, yeah, but I, I actually don't know where the setter part comes from. I'd be interested as well. Yeah, I don't know exactly either. We we took both of our – we took our air setter and golden retriever to U.K. when we moved there. It was a humongous hassle, but we flew them yep. overseas to get there. Yeah, they have some and, crazy uh, laws about – yeah we had to have them in quarantine for six months and but when we got to the uk um my irish setter just immediately knew all about pheasant it was like you said and it just ingrained in the dna he would he would smell them out under a bush 
and then just flush them out. And just out of nowhere, we'd see these pheasant flying out, and um, and he just he just instinctively knew that was his that was his job, that was his calling in life, and it was uh, it was amazing to watch that. But do you work with people who are also um, trying to train their dogs to hunt? Uh, not hunting. I know there are a number of people here in the state and. I'm sure there are very good trainers here in the state that specifically train for hunting. I don't personally do any hunting. Mm-hmm. Um, I know there, there's just a lot of it around here, but I don't personally do any of it. How do you train your dogs for protection? Like you said, like your that's your primary goal for, for most of the people who work with you, right? Uh, no. So, so the primary, uh, the primary thing that we deal with is dog aggression, human aggression, leash reactivity, that kind of stuff with pet dogs, Mm -hmm. um, as well as on and off leash obedience. So, so we kind of get a mixture. Most of the stuff that we deal with is, is aggression, but there are dogs that, you know, they just want the dog to be able to go hiking with them completely off leash or, or take walks around the neighborhood off leash, those kind of things. And so we kind of get a mix of both. Um, but my hobby And the thing that I'm the most passionate about is protection sports. So all of my personal dogs are all trained for protection, um, in, in a couple different sports that I, that I, uh, that interest me. So how do you compete in those sports with your dogs? I've, I've never seen like a product, a protection, is it like a protection sport competition type thing? Yeah. So there, there are three big, uh, three organizations here in America that are, uh, kind of the dominant org- organizations for protection sports. There's Schutzen, which I talked about earlier. Uh, mm-hmm. They call it Schutzen IPO or IGP. You'll kind of hear all three of those names. They're all the same thing. They've just changed the name over over the years. Schutzen was what originated in in Germany, and then they changed to IPO, and then they changed to IGP. But that's probably the biggest and the what I would consider the easiest to get into for most dogs. Um, then there are two other sports called Frenching and Mondeuring, and those are the two that I primarily, uh, that I primarily compete in. Hmm. Um, and those two are, are a little bit, uh, they're in my opinion, more difficult for most dogs. So I've seen border collies and all kinds of dogs, even, even little, uh, terriers do an IPO and Schutzen. Mondeuring and Frenching are much more, uh, kind of dominated by the Belgian Malinois, which we talked about earlier, and then another breed called the Dutch Shepherd, which is basically a Malinois. So those two sports are the ones that I compete in, and uh, they're a lot like how you would train a police dog. So Mm -hmm. uh, the the guy is in a full suit, so the dog can bite basically anywhere. Um, You have what we call a defensive handler, where the dog has to protect the owner uh, from a bad guy aggressing at them. They have what we call an object guard where you would put down a box or whatever, and the dog has to protect it and guard it. Uh, I think they kind of came up with that from like suitcases with money or their children or whatever they wanted to protect. And, and so there's that. And then there are just long attacks where, for example, if a ga- bad guy's running from you, you send your dog on them. And then just as important as that they bite. We also have a exercise where we send the dog and they have to come back to us when we tell them before they bite. So that's a, uh, in police canine certifications, the dog has to obviously be able to go and bite somebody. But if the canine officer needs to call their dog back after they sent them, they realize it was a mistake or the guy's, you know, put his hands up and dropped mm-hmm. to the ground, they can call that dog back. So all of those exercises are in the sport that we do. That's very cool. So, so what's the process for training a dog to bite on command? Like, how do you, how do you teach them that that's okay with a one specific command, but you know, obviously not okay most of the time. Yeah. 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 So, so that's the, the kind of the interesting and biggest misconception in protection sports is a lot of people think that because my dog is biting somebody that they're aggressive. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, it's, for me, it's almost the exact opposite. My dogs bite only because they enjoy biting things. They've been bred just like a, a pointer has been bred to point out birds, just like a, a collie has been bred <coughs> to nip at the heels of sheep or whatever to get them moving and to get them going in a specific direction. My dogs have been bred to be OCD about having something in their mouth. And so we use equipment, mm-hmm. um, either a bite sleeve, which is common for that sport Schutzen or a full body suit 
which is common for monitoring, French ring, police work, all of those. And so my dogs are just OCD about having something in their mouth. And so from a young age, from eight weeks old, we start frustrating them with the, a toy that is that equipment. They mm -hmm. start chasing it. They bite it. We encourage it. Over time, we build their, their desire to do that. And so just like we were talking about dogs that are reactive on the leash, the way that I train a personal protection dog is almost the exact same way that I'm telling all of my pet clients not to allow their dog to do. So when I'm training a personal protection dog, a police dog, a sport dog, anything that's going to bite, I allow them to pull on a harness. I allow them to get frustrated. And, and then as soon as they get frustrated enough and they're barking and they're doing things that I want, I give them their reward. Huh. So training a pet dog when you're out taking your dog for a walk and your dog is pulling you around trying to get to a person or a dog, you're training it to do those things. And then the minute you stop doing those and you stop allowing your dog to get to those dogs or people or the things that they want, your dog is going to start to become frustrated. And that frustration is going to lead to leash reactivity or, or potentially even aggression. Mm -hmm. So it's literally the exact same thing I tell all of my pet clients never to do is what I do to train personal protection dogs and you're just, you're things. just always reinforcing the behavior that you want your dog to exhibit, whether it's a, you know, a behavior most people would want, which is dogs not being reactive on a leash or something you do want in the case of protection where the dog is reacting on the leash. And right. Just reinforce right. it with treats and good boy, good Praise, girl. whatever, yes. And, and really, you know, I, I tell all of my clients, if you have an eight-week-old puppy, almost almost treat it like it's a three-year-old dog if you don't want it to do it as a three-year-old dog don't allow it to do it as a puppy yeah. so you know if you don't want your dog lunging at other people or other dogs don't allow it to do it as a puppy you know we use food we engage them we get them to pay attention to us versus those dogs or people that we want them to ignore so just treat it like it's an adult dog and, and it'll be a better dog for that that's very cool yeah. So where is your, where is your business located? So we train out of a, a eight acre piece of ground in, in Payson. So mm -hmm. Utah County, um, that's where our training facility is. That's, uh, we live right there on the property, everything. Uh, we have a field for the protection work. We have a field for our, our pet dogs. We have a agility course for confidence building. We have a pond to swim dogs. We have everything there. So it's cool. all right down there in Utah County. Those agility courses are awesome. My, yep. my, uh, best friend's daughter has got into agility training and she's like a pro now she's probably been to your course she's like got a dog named carrie and she's like just amazing at it it's fun and the dogs love it mm -hmm. you know it's it's another thing that's fantastic for mental exercise yeah so it, that's both obviously it's mental and physical exercise combined in one and that's yeah it's fantastic for them yeah, we went on a little trip, and she was watching our dogs, and, and on the trip, we were super worried because they need so much exercise, but she was just set up her agility training in our backyard, just yep. a, a gate thing that she trained our, she tried to train our dogs to jump over it, and she showed us, like, the first videos, and my dog, Joey, was just totally going around it. He wouldn't <laughs> jump over it, but then by the end, he was jumping over it and starting to get it, and it, it was just awesome to see that. Yeah, it's fun. You know, anytime you, it, it's just like when I'm doing stuff with my kids, when they learn something, it's a huge amount of joy. It's just the same with dogs. You know, I travel, I travel a lot uh, for my dog competitions to Europe and France, Belgium, different places. Wow. And the culture in, in America is very, very different from the culture in Europe. So we allow our dogs typically to pull, to, you know, do a lot of different things that in, in Europe, you just don't see dogs doing. So it's kind of interesting seeing the, the difference in those, but a lot of it just comes down to, they go out and they do things with their dogs. They go out and they enjoy teaching them new things like that. And for me, it brings me a ton of joy when I see my puppy or my dog learn something new, um, or nail something that I've been working on for a while. And so I would, I would love to see that culture start to come here to America where we start getting your dogs out and training them and taking them out to parks and tr taking them out on trails for hikes. And those things, the more you do those things, the better your dog gets. If you leave them at home and in your front room for their whole life, they're, they're never going to get better. By yeah. Just I, I, my, my neighborhood's kind of interesting because it's like, there's a lot of people with dogs and, and a lot more people are walking their dogs off leash. I'm noticing more and more. 
And I have one dog that I would feel very confident to walk off leash all the time, my Irish setter. Um, but it's like, there's a lot of people who just get dogs and they put them behind a fence and those dogs are just barking all freaking day long. Yep. And they're obviously frustrated. They're not happy. It's, it's like, why have a dog if you're not going to constantly be at least just walking it around the neighborhood, get, giving it some sort of stimulation. And it's just sad when you see that. But um, so you find that in Europe, dog owners by and large are a little more responsible about teaching their dogs new things and being more engaged with them. Yeah. So that, like I say, the culture over there is very different here in America. We have, you know, our, our, I would say the most common thing for a pet owner to do is, Oh, let's take the puppy to group classes at Petco or PetSmart. Right. Mm. The downside to those is they're set up to fail. Pets, Petco and PetSmart, their trainers typically take a three hour course online or something like that. That's how they learn to train dogs before that they didn't do anything. And so for, for somebody like that to be out there giving dog training advice is in my opinion, kind of neglectful, right? Yeah. Um, over there in, in Europe, all, a lot of cities over there have dog training clubs where you can go and you can go and get your dog trained a lot of time for free or for a very minimal price. So here we have soccer fields, we have basketball courts, we have tennis courts that are all sponsored and paid for by the city. They have those type of things for dogs in Europe. And so one of, one of my good friends uh, runs a dog, a dog club in, in Belgium, and I think they charge $2 to come and train with them two euros wow. to come and train your dog for a day. So you get an hour class for two euros. Wow. Over here, that would never happen. Mm -hmm. And if it did, you were probably getting information from somebody that has no clue over there. This person's been running a club for 30 years. So yeah. he has very good information. He's very good at what he does. And if you walk around Belgium, if you walk around France, the dogs typically are very very under control they're social they you know they take their dogs out and they do things with them regularly and so the dogs are very well trained you know i go to europe and i never see dogs just sitting there pulling on the leash that like i see here so yeah it's just different and i, I love seeing the dogs over there and seeing how different they are than the dogs here and so you actually fly your dogs overseas to mm -hmm. do these competitions wow yeah, so uh, in 2015 and 2016, I competed in uh, world championships over there. So I had to take my dog um, underneath in the cargo. We take it over there. We, you know, give it two weeks or so to get acclimated to the time change, to the temperature change and all of those things. But, yeah, we take them over there. We, uh, you know, they come with us everywhere. So That's so cool. Yeah, yeah it, it was such a huge ordeal for us to get our dogs to UK. Yep. But we, we go to Europe I mean, probably about every other year on average, because my wife lives over her. She's from Bosnia, but she grew up in Germany partially too. But it's you. So you go to Belgium for a lot of your competitions, or you go to the, they, they're all over. Those two were just in Belgium and France. Um, this year was in Poland. Last year was in Russia. Oh, so so you've they're seen all the, over. You've seen the whole world because of your dogs. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So we we travel a lot. Like this year. Um, this year I didn't take a dog. I, I went to compete uh, as a as a decoy, as the bad guy that gets bit. Um, and uh, so we just went over, but we were able to go see Poland, Czech Republic, uh, London, wow. know, UK. Take your uh, kids too? France. I, I didn't. I went with my wife and uh, my two nieces and then one of my friends. So, But, yeah, we were able to just travel around. So the, do the dog training has definitely opened up a whole – whole world that I probably wouldn't have ever seen if I wasn't training dogs. So that's awesome. Pretty cool. How did you get into it originally? Uh, when I was 10, I got a German shepherd, uh, had no clue what I was doing. Just told my parents I wanted a dog. Uh, they got me a dog. By the time it was two, it attacked, I think five dogs, broken a dog's leg, almost killed a poodle. It, it attacked, I don't even know how many chickens. And, uh, my dad was like, we're going to put it down i'm like no we're not you know i was 12 years old we're not putting my dog down mm -hmm. and so uh so my my mom knew a, a guy that had been training german shepherds for roughly 30 years uh, his name was don willett down in or in linden and i lived in a small town called spring city in utah down in kind of the center of utah and so it was an hour and a half away and i was 12 years old so my mom uh, was willing to drive me up once a week for these group classes to come up and train and pretty quickly I got addicted to it uh, you know I'm a complete dog person 
So mm-hmm. it was obviously in, in me at that time. Um, and so I kept going to the classes even after I was done with the class. Uh, I got my dog to the point where I could go and compete with it in dog shows and different things. And by the time I was 16, I had 10 German Shepherds that I was competing with. Whoa. So I got addicted pretty quick and Your parents were in. cool with that, to have 10 German yeah, Shepherds? Yeah, so my, my mom was super supportive. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, if it wasn't for her, I, I, w- I wouldn't be where I am today for sure. How many so, dogs do you have now? Right now I have seven dogs between me and my wife. Wow. So, that's great. Yep. I guess if you can have the land to have that many dogs, that's yeah. probably a ton of fun. Yeah, it's it's fun. And they they all have jobs, so every single one of them is trained and competes in these these sports. Um, and so, you know, they, they're all always doing something. We train uh, three times a week specifically for the sport, and then every day we're out running around the property, taking them on hikes, whatever, so... Yeah, I, I grew up with cats, and I was never a dog person. And I, like, I don't think a lot of people really understand how amazingly fun it is to have a super tight connection with your dogs, and to just be on the same wavelength, and to be out in nature with them, and to see the world through their eyes, and and how incredibly excited they are about being outside and and experiencing nature through mostly the olfactory just like everything they're getting i mean most of what they're taking in is not their eyes it's through their nose absolutely and they're just absolutely totally engaged in what what they're taking in and i'll see for example like um a squirrel and i'll it'll run past they don't see it but they can smell it like a few seconds after it's already run past and then they're just running and they're running after that smell. And it's just such an amazing, fascinating world that they live in. So it's just something I've I've gotten into in the last, um, I guess, 10 years. But yeah, it's just, I, I think a lot of people, they get a dog because they have a yard and then they'll keep the dog behind the fence and they don't actively engage the dog. And I think the, the best thing we ever did was take our dog to a class. I mean, when he was a puppy because you're just not going to like your dog as much if you don't get him educated, if you don't train him, if you don't train him into an animal who you like being around. Yep. Do, you, do you think that's the biggest biggest problem with a lot of dog owners too? They just don't understand the importance of proper training? I, I don't know if it's that they don't understand the, the importance. I, I think it's more so the time commitment. So everybody is so busy nowadays with – you know, their phone with their work with everything that my, my primary business is, is what we call boot camps where the dogs come and they stay with us. We do all the training, we socialize them, we stop all their bad behaviors. And then we teach you basically what we did and how to continue it. So it's kind of turning over a a completely trained dog. And so I think a lot of people are just very busy and taking the time to train a a puppy is, it's a lot, you know, I spend, I have a, a 13, 14 week old puppy right now that I spend between everything throughout the day, probably two, three hours training that specific dog, you know, when they're puppies, I take more time because they have so much that they, that I want them to learn, but not many people have the, the amount of time to do that. So I'm lucky that this is all I do. And so I'm able to, to do that, but most people don't have that time. Yeah, that's true. No, most people don't have the time I have to be able to take my dogs to nature. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So so when they do get the opportunity, they don't want to take their dog because the dog potentially isn't trained well enough to take it out to those places. And so, mm-hmm. um, so I would say that's the biggest thing. But, but really, you know, when, when I'm doing stuff with my dog, I'm always training my dog. So you could take the amount of time that you're hanging out with the dog or, or you know, just allowing it to run around your house and terrorize your house. You could take those 15 minutes every single day and put towards training and as you do that, obviously your dog is going to get better. So I tell all my clients that they all, you know, pretty much everyone asks me, how much time do I have to spend specifically training my dog now that you've trained it? Most, most of the time you don't have to take any amount of time specifically on the dog, but throughout the day, when you ask it to come, make sure it comes to you. And, you know, if you, if you have guests come over and you want it to go lay down in its place or on its bed, make sure it does that when you ask it to. So if you do those things, if you're out hiking with your dogs and you say, come you know you're i don't want you chasing that chipmunk off that cliff Mm -hmm. i want my dog to come to me so if you train the dog in those situations that you're already in that's the biggest thing you don't necessarily have to take a ton of time just do it when you're doing it do you find it's really difficult when your dog 
is on a scent and their adrenaline gets <clears throat> pumped to, to come back to you, that is my biggest problem. Yeah, so that's it's almost impossible. So to get a dog to come to you when it's, uh, we call it competing motivators. So something else that's more motivating than I am, it's mm-hmm. very g- difficult to get a dog to come away from that. So we start that as a young age. If you go to our, our uh, Facebook page or our Instagram page, you'll see videos of us talking about what we call a call away. So basically when our puppies are young, we have somebody else with food feeding our puppy and then we have food as well. And then I call my puppy to me. As soon as I call, the other person stops giving it food and covers it up. So my puppy learns that it can come away from something of value, which is that person feeding it, and come back to me. So it's just a, a, a trick to say you can leave something that you want to come back to me and there's something huh. more valuable at, at me. And if you don't teach it that skill, when you need it, they're definitely not going to come to you. Yeah. So we break it down. Everything for us is breaking things down. If I want my dog to sit, I don't go out in the wilderness and say, sit. I go in my front room where my dog is very comfortable. Mm -hmm. I use food. I lure it into the position that I want and I reward it. And then I do it in my backyard and then I do it in my front yard and then I do it at the park and then I do it, you know, at Mm -hmm. Home Depot or something. And then my dog is generalized to know that, that command in a bunch of different places. So then when I'm out hiking and I tell it to sit, it's like, man, I know this. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll, I, I know how to sit. I do the same thing for come. I have another dog or my kids or whatever. And my dog is around them. I say, come, you come to me. I reward you so that when I'm out hiking, you've already seen a, a lot of different distractions and a lot of different competing motivators. And you know that you can come to me. Yeah. So, okay. So, but Yeah. That's, that's my biggest challenge is yep. my dogs are perfect in the parks um, cause there's nothing there that's so competing for their attention like me. And, but when we're like the, the, t- the two times they've seen these turkeys, the, especially my dog scamps, she just got freaking totally riled up. Like she just wanted to jump in the air and take it down. She just would not come. And she, it was like 15, 20 minutes. I had to wait for her to calm down a little bit, but she's just like amped up and she's just in this totally different state of mind where she's just not coming for anything. Yep. And so, and, and that's yeah, a I difficult one when they're chasing a prey item. Mm-hmm. That's one of the, I mean, that's m- maybe the biggest competing motivator, cats, birds, rabbits, those kind of things to get your dog to come away from that. That's difficult. Can you create some kind of artificial, um, prey animals so that you can train a dog to do that in your own backyard or is that, is yeah, that yeah. So, so we do it with, uh, with toys. So if I take a tennis ball and I have taught my dog to play fetch, uh, we do in, in the sport, like I was talking about earlier, when we do those call, call offs, I send my dog to attack. I tell my dog to come back to me before it bites. That is basically them chasing a prey item and me telling them to come back before they get to it. So we teach it initially uh, in, in fetch or tug. So we take our tennis ball or, or our tug, we throw it, our dog is going to chase it, we call them back to us, and they get something better back at us. Oh, so, okay. But I can't just let my dog free and throw it. So we put it on a harness, we teach our dog, we throw it, we let the dog drag us to it, the dog gets the ball, they come back, we play with them, we throw the ball again, we drag them to it, they get it, they bring it back to us, we let them drag. And then once they're doing that and we know they're dedicated to going to get it, then we throw it, we let them drag, we call them to us before they get it. And because they're on a harness and a leash, we can stop them. Mm -hmm. So they're like, no, I want to get to it, I want to get to it. We show them that we have something better. They come back to us and they get it back at us. So we're showing them that there's something very fun there, which is the ball that I just threw. But if you come back to me, you're going to get something better. So every dog is different. Uh, My dogs, the bigger the toy, the better. So we use just a bigger toy. Hmm. But some dogs will like food more than chasing the ball. And so we can give them food. So it kind of just depends on the dog. But absolutely, you can set all pretty much anything up. If you just think about it, all right, I've got a dog that's chasing this. I've got a dog that's doing this. Just think about what would be equivalent and and set up a training session. And you'll have to do this over and over. This isn't something you do one time and you say, yeah, he's got it for the rest of his life. We set it up in a bunch of different situations in different uh, different ways. And then I'm pretty sure and hope that my dog does it out in a real situation. Yeah, because I'm amazed by people who can train their dogs to hunt with them because my dogs just won't shut up 
they're just way too noisy and they're always going after the squirrels but i would love to be able to like go really quietly to these big game animals and just watch them just and be quiet with my dogs and just be able to look the, and just be sitting there gazing at these amazing animals because i know we will occasionally come upon a moose or some elk but they're just like gonna run after them and screw it all up so we won't be able to watch them yeah so that's that's definitely good advice for how you train them uh, i guess we gotta fortunately i gotta go pretty soon but um do you have any other good advice for people who would just um just for training their dogs at, at home, trying to get a little bit better performance out of their their dogs and, and settling down? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing is just d- don't go in and say, I'm going to commit to a half hour every single day to train my dog. If you do that, it's just like somebody saying, I'm, I'm going to go to the gym five times a week, you know, and then it's, ah, uh, I don't want to go today. I'll, I'll definitely go tomorrow. And then it's, ah, uh, I've got, I, I uh, this came up, you know, the same thing when I started going to the gym, I didn't start going for an hour and a half. I started for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So do the exact same thing with your dog. Take three minutes and train it every single day for three minutes or take, you know, three minutes, train it three times a day, three minutes each nine minutes. If you, if you can't put nine minutes into your dog, you probably shouldn't have a dog. Mm -hmm. So, you know, break those up into small sessions and most dogs do better with small sessions in the beginning. Anyway, they, you know, dogs have ADD, they check out. We want to make sure that they're engaged with us and paying attention when we're doing it. So just break it up, spend small amounts of time. Just build up the build up their abilities. And, and then, you know, right now I could go train my dog for three hours and they would continue going the whole time if, if I wanted if I wanted them to, even with mental exercise, they'd be whooped. But they would do it because I built them up to be able to, you know, be able to do that. But just take mm-hmm. it slow. You know, keep it very simple. Food motivation. You know, there's a ton of videos on our on our website, on our Instagram, our Facebook of training puppies what's your, with food. What's your website? We, we have two different websites: roughswag.com, which is uh, uh, dog gear and apparel, and then we have Innovative Canine Academy, which is our pet dog training business. So both of those, we share videos on both of different things: training how to how to come, how to sit, how to lay down, how to uh, ignore distractions. All of these things on when we post those on our social media cool. so. and people could sign up for your classes too through those websites Is yes absolutely way? yep cool yeah, can we put those in the show notes tyler yeah, I'm ready all right well uh thanks so much for being on the program it's my yeah, pleasure this has been a, this has been a fun conversation it's my pleasure all right um, until next time this has been rich marcosian for the utah stories podcast Check us out at our YouTube channel. We've been getting tons of subscribers. I don't know if it's related to the podcast or my old videos, but it's awesome. We're getting like five subscribers a day, and um, it's because we bo- we both put out these podcasts and we do videos on all sorts of issues that in- impact Utah and our quality of life here. And I think you'll probably enjoy those videos we've got out there. And uh, check us out at utahstories.com and subscribe to our newsletter. That's the best way to get new information about what we're doing. And uh, until next time, this has been Richard Marcosian signing out. The Utah Story Show is brought to you in part by Curry Pizza, who has been serving Indian food for over 10 years. They opened their first location in a small town called Bicknell in southern Utah. That's when they began serving some of the incredible pizzas such as chicken tikiki, sorry, chicken tiki masala pizza with all fresh spices and ingredients, old world fresh Italian sausage and spicy sausage, as well as mango korma pizza. Guy Fieri recently learned about curry pizza and featured them on his show Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. Check out the episode, but more importantly, check out curry pizza. They are truly awesome. The Utah Story Show is also brought to you by Paisley's Grass-Fed Beef. Premium, all-natural grass-fed beef delivered uh, fresh to your door, free, anywhere in the state of Utah. Order yours today at paisleys.com. That's P-A-I-Z-L-E-E-S.com. Paisley's Grass-Fed Beef, always the right choice. The Utah Story Show is also brought to you by Utah State Home of the Aggies. Living on campus means more sleep, more friends, and better grades. While others are driving or walking to campus, you're getting those precious extra minutes of sleep. Instead of going home to your mom or your cat, you're hanging out with roommates, neighbors, and friends. 
on-campus housing is a community of academic support, peers, mentors, friends, and constant activities. For a virtual tour, room details, theme options, and to apply, visit usu.edu forward slash housing. Utah Story Show is also brought to you by Legends Pub and Grill, which is locally owned and serves fresh, wholesome, delicious ingredients. They have everything from awesome appetizers to main dishes like steaks, burgers, and sandwiches, salads, pizzas, calzones. Plus, they now offer gluten-free and vegetarian options. Legends features over 30 craft beers, and they have talented bartenders that make all sorts of tasty creations featuring local spirits. Kick back, watch your favorite game on their big screens while you enjoy a truly awesome meal. They accommodate all ages because they have a bar area and they have a restaurant area, which you have to do in Utah. And they have two locations to serve you, downtown at 677 South, 200 West, and at their brand new Southtown location, 10631 South, Holiday Park Drive in Sandy, Utah. 